Chapter Four of A Distinguished Provincial at Paris by Honoré de Balzac, translated by Ellen Marriage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter Four. Next day, towards noon, Lucien betook himself to Staub, the great tailor of that day partly by dint of entreaties and partly by virtue of cash lucien succeeded in obtaining a promise that his clothes should be ready in time for the great day staub went so far as to give his word that a perfectly elegant coat a waistcoat and a pair of trousers should be forthcoming lucien then ordered linen and pocket handkerchiefs a little outfit in short of a linen draper and a celebrated bootmaker measured him for shoes and boots he bought a neat walking cane at Verdier's. He went to Madame Irlande for gloves and shirt studs. In short, he did his best to reach the climax of dandyism. When he had satisfied all his fancies, he went to the Rue Neuve de Luxembourg and found that Louise had gone out. She was dining with Madame la Marquise d'Espard, her maid said, and would not be back till late. Lucien dined for two francs at a restaurant in the Palais Royal and went to bed early. The next day was Sunday. He went to Louise's lodging at eleven o'clock. Louise had not yet risen. At two o'clock he returned once more. Madame cannot see anybody yet, reported Albertine, but she gave me a line for you. Cannot see anybody yet, repeated Lucien but i am not anybody i do not know albertine answered very impertinently and lucien less surprised by albertine's answer than by a note from madame de bargeton took the billet and read the following discouraging lines madame d'espard is not well she will not be able to see you on monday i am not feeling very well myself but i am about to dress and go to keep her company I am in despair over this little disappointment, but your talents reassure me you will make your way without charlatanism. And no signature, Lucien said to himself. He found himself in the Tuileries before he knew whither he was walking. With the gift of second sight which accompanies genius, he began to suspect that the chilly note was but a warning of the catastrophe to come lost in thought he walked on and on gazing at the monuments in the place louis quinze it was a sunny day a stream of fine carriages went past him on the way to the champs elysees following the direction of the crowd of strollers he saw the three or four thousand carriages that turn the champs elysees into an improvised longchamp on sunday afternoons in summer the splendid horses the toilettes and liveries bewildered him he went further and further until he reached the arc de triomphe then unfinished what were his feelings when as he returned he saw madame de bargeton and madame d'espard coming towards him in a wonderfully appointed caleche with a chasseur behind it in waving plumes and that gold embroidered green uniform which he knew only too well there was a block somewhere in the row and the carriages waited lucien beheld louise transformed beyond recognition all the colors of her toilette had been carefully subordinated to her complexion her dress was delicious her hair gracefully and becomingly arranged her hat in exquisite taste was remarkable even beside madame d'espard that leader of fashion there is something in the art of wearing a hat that escapes definition tilted too far to the back of the head it imparts a bold expression to the face bring it too far forward it gives you a sinister look tipped to one side it has a jaunty air a well-dressed woman wears her hat exactly as she means to wear it and exactly at the right angle madame de bargeton had solved this curious problem at sight a dainty girdle outlined her slender waist she had adopted her cousin's gestures and tricks of manner and now as she sat by madame d'espard's side she played with a tiny scent bottle that dangled by a slender gold chain from one of her fingers 
displayed a little well-gloved hand without seeming to do so she had modelled herself on madame d'espard without mimicking her the marquise had found a cousin worthy of her and seemed to be proud of her pupil the men and women on the footways all gazed at the splendid carriage with the bearings of the d'espards and blamont chauvries upon the panels lucien was amazed at the number of greetings received by the cousins he did not know that the all paris which consists in some score of salons was well aware already of the relationship between the ladies a little group of young men on horseback accompanied the carriage in the bois lucien could recognize de marsay and rastignac among them and could see from their gestures that the pair of coxcombs were complimenting madame de bargeton upon her transformation madame d'espard was radiant with health and grace so her indisposition was simply a pretext for ridding herself of him for there had been no mention of another day the wrathful poet went towards the caleche he walked slowly waited till he came in full sight of the two ladies and made them a bow madame de bargeton would not see him but the marquise put up her eyeglass and deliberately cut him he had been disowned by the sovereign lords of angouleme but to be disowned by society in paris was another thing the booby squires by doing their utmost to mortify lucien admitted his power and acknowledged him as a man for madame d'espard he had positively no existence this was a sentence it was a refusal of justice poor poet a deadly cold seized on him when he saw de marsay eyeing him through his glass and when the parisian lion let that optical instrument fall it dropped in so singular a fashion that lucien thought of the knife-blade of the guillotine the caleche went by rage and a craving for vengeance took possession of his slighted soul if madame de bargeton had been in his power he would have cut her throat at that moment he was a fouquier tinville gloating over the pleasure of sending madame d'espard to the scaffold if only he could have put de marsay to the torture with refinements of savage cruelty canalis went by on horseback bowing to the prettiest women his dress elegant as became the most dainty of poets great heavens exclaimed lucien money money at all costs money is the one power before which the world bends the knee no cried conscience not money but glory and glory means work work that was what david said great heavens what am i doing here but i will triumph i will drive along this avenue in a caleche with a chasseur behind me i will possess a marquise d'espard and flinging out the wrathful words he went to urbain's to dine for two francs next morning at nine o'clock he went to the rue neuve de luxembourg to upbraid louise for her barbarity but madame de bargeton was not at home to him and not only so but the porter would not allow him to go up to her rooms so he stayed outside in the street watching the house till noon at twelve o'clock chatelet came out looked at lucien out of the corner of his eye and avoided him stung to the quick lucien hurried after his rival and chatelet finding himself closely pursued turned and bowed evidently intending to shake him off by this courtesy spare me just a moment for pity's sake sir said lucien i want just a word or two with you you have shown me friendship i now ask the most trifling service of that friendship you have just come from madame de bargeton how have i fallen into disgrace with her and madame d'espard please explain monsieur chardin do you know why the ladies left you at the opera that evening asked chatelet with treacherous good-nature no said the poor poet well it was monsieur de rastignac who spoke against you from the beginning they asked him about you and the young dandy simply said that your name was chardin 
and not de rubempre that your mother was a monthly nurse that your father when he was alive was an apothecary in lumeau a suburb of angouleme and that your sister a charming girl gets up shirts to admiration and is just about to be married to a local printer named sechard such is the world you no sooner show yourself than it pulls you to pieces monsieur de marsay came to madame d'espard to laugh at you with her so the two ladies thinking that your presence put them in a false position went out at once do not attempt to go to either house if madame de bargeton continued to receive your visits her cousin would have nothing to do with her you have genius try to avenge yourself the world looks down upon you look down in your turn upon the world take refuge in some garret write your masterpieces seize on power of any kind and you will see the world at your feet then you can give back the bruises which you have received and in the very place where they were given madame de bargeton will be the more distant now because she has been friendly that is the way with women but the question now for you is not how to win back anais's friendship but how to avoid making an enemy of her i will tell you of a way she has written letters to you send all her letters back to her she will be sensible that you are acting like a gentleman and at a later time if you should need her she will not be hostile for my own part i have so high an opinion of your future that i have taken your part everywhere and if i can do anything here for you you will always find me ready to be of use the elderly beau seemed to have grown young again in the atmosphere of paris he bowed with frigid politeness but lucien woe-begone haggard and undone forgot to return the salutation he went back to his inn and there found the great staub himself come in person not so much to try his customer's clothes as to make inquiries of the landlady with regard to that customer's financial status the report had been satisfactory lucien had travelled post madame de bargeton brought him back from vaudeville last thursday in her carriage staub addressed lucien as monsieur le comte and called his customer's attention to the artistic skill with which he had brought a charming figure into relief a young man in such a costume has only to walk in the tuileries he said and he will marry an english heiress within a fortnight lucien brightened a little under the influences of the german tailor's joke the perfect fit of his new clothes the fine cloth and the sight of a graceful figure which met his eyes in the looking-glass vaguely he told himself that paris was the capital of chance and for the moment he believed in chance had he not a volume of poems and a magnificent romance entitled the archer of charles the ninth in manuscript he had hope for the future staub promised the overcoat and the rest of the clothes the next day the next day the bootmaker linen draper and tailor all returned armed each with his bill which lucien still under the charm of provincial habits paid forthwith not knowing how otherwise to rid himself of them after he had paid there remained but three hundred and sixty francs out of the two thousand which he had brought with him from angouleme and he had been but one week in paris nevertheless he dressed and went to take a stroll in the terrasse des foyons he had his day of triumph he looked so handsome and so graceful he was so well dressed that women looked at him two or three were so much struck with his beauty that they turned their heads to look again lucien studied the gait and carriage of the young men on the terrasse and took a lesson in fine manners while he meditated on his three hundred and sixty francs that evening alone in his chamber an idea occurred to him which threw a light on the problem of his existence at the gaillard bois where he lived on the plainest fare thinking to economize in this way he asked for his account as if he meant to leave and discovered that he was indebted to his landlord to the extent of a hundred francs the next morning was spent in running around the latin quarter recommended for its cheapness by david 
for a long while he looked about till finally in the rue de cluny close to the sorbonne he discovered a place where he could have a furnished room for such a price as he could afford to pay he settled with his hostess of the gaillard bois and took up his quarters in the rue de cluny that same day his removal only cost him the cab fare when he had taken possession of his poor room he made a packet of madame de bargeton's letters laid them on the table and sat down to write to her but before he wrote he fell to thinking over that fatal week he did not tell himself that he had been the first to be faithless that for a sudden fancy he had been ready to leave his louise without knowing what would become of her in paris he saw none of his own shortcomings but he saw his present position and blamed madame de bargeton for it she was to have lighted his way instead she had ruined him he grew indignant he grew proud he worked himself into a paroxysm of rage and set himself to compose the following epistle what would you think madame of a woman who should take a fancy to some poor and timid child full of the noble superstitions which the grown man calls illusions and using all the charms of woman's coquetry all her most delicate ingenuity should feign a mother's love to lead that child astray her fondest promises the card castles which raised his wonder cost her nothing she leads him on tightens her hold upon him sometimes coaxing sometimes scolding him for his want of confidence till the child leaves his home and follows her blindly to the shores of a vast sea smiling she lures him into a frail skiff and sends him forth alone and helpless to face the storm standing safe on the rock she laughs and wishes him luck you are that woman i am that child the child has a keepsake in his hands something which might betray the wrongs done by your beneficence your kindness in deserting him you might have to blush if you saw him struggling for life and chanced to recollect that once you clasped him to your breast when you read these words the keepsake will be in your own safe keeping you are free to forget everything once you pointed out fair hopes to me in the skies i awake to find reality in the squalid poverty of paris while you pass and others bow before you on your brilliant path in the great world i i whom you deserted on the threshold shall be shivering in the wretched garret to which you consigned me yet some pang may perhaps trouble your mind amid festivals and pleasures you may think sometimes of the child whom you thrust into the depths if so madame think of him without remorse out of the depths of his misery the child offers you the one thing left to him his forgiveness in a last look yes madame thanks to you i have nothing left nothing was not the world created from nothing genius should follow the divine example i begin with godlike forgiveness but as yet i know not whether i possess the godlike power you need only tremble lest i should go astray for you would be answerable for my sins alas i pity you for you will have no part in the future towards which i go with work as my guide after penning this rhetorical effusion full of the sombre dignity which an artist of one-and-twenty is rather apt to overdo lucien's thoughts went back to them at home he saw the pretty rooms which david had furnished for him at the cost of part of his little store and a vision rose before him of quiet simple pleasures in the past shadowy figures came about him he saw his mother and eve and david and heard their sobs over his leave-taking and at that he began to cry himself for he felt very lonely in paris and friendless and forlorn two or three days later he wrote to his sister my dear eve when a sister shares the life of a brother who devotes himself to art it is her sad privilege to take more sorrow than joy into her life and i am beginning to fear that i shall be a great trouble to you 
have i not abused your goodness already have not all of you sacrificed yourselves to me it is the memory of the past so full of family happiness that helps me to bear up in my present loneliness now that i have tasted the first beginnings of poverty and the treachery of the world of paris how my thoughts have flown to you swift as an eagle back to its eyrie so that i might be with true affection again did you see sparks in the candle did a coal pop out of the fire did you hear singing in your ears and did mother say lucien is thinking of us and david answer he is fighting his way in the world my eve i am writing this letter for your eyes only i cannot tell any one else all that has happened to me good and bad blushing for both as i write for good here is as rare as evil ought to be you shall have a great piece of news in a very few words madame de bargeton was ashamed of me disowned me would not see me and gave me up nine days after we came to paris she saw me in the street and looked another way when simply to follow her into the society to which she meant to introduce me i had spent seventeen hundred and sixty francs out of the two thousand i brought from angouleme the money so hardly scraped together how did you spend it you will ask paris is a strange bottomless gulf my poor sister you can dine here for less than a franc yet the simplest dinner at a fashionable restaurant costs fifty francs there are waistcoats and trousers to be had for four francs and two francs each but a fashionable tailor never charges less than a hundred francs you pay for everything you pay a halfpenny to cross the kennel in the street when it rains you cannot go the least little way in a cab for less than thirty-two sous i have been staying in one of the best parts of paris but now i am living at the hotel de cluny in the rue de cluny one of the poorest and darkest slums shut in between three churches and the old buildings of the sorbonne i have a furnished room on the fourth floor it is very bare and very dirty but all the same i pay fifteen francs a month for it for breakfast i spend a penny on a roll and a halfpenny for milk but i dine very decently for twenty-two sous at a restaurant kept by a man named Fricoteau in the place de la sorbonne itself my expenses every month will not exceed sixty francs everything included until the winter begins at least i hope not so my two hundred and forty francs ought to last me for the first four months between now and then i shall have sold the archer of charles the ninth and the marguerite no doubt do not be in the least uneasy on my account if the present is cold and bare and poverty-stricken the blue distant future is rich and splendid most great men have known the vicissitudes which depress but cannot overwhelm me plautus the great comic latin poet was once a miller's lad machiavelli wrote the prince at night and by day was a common working man like any one else and more than all the great cervantes who lost an arm at the battle of lepanto and helped to win that famous day was called a base-born handless dotard by the scribblers of his day there was an interval of ten years between the appearance of the first part and the second of his sublime don quixote for lack of a publisher things are not so bad as that nowadays mortifications and want only fall to the lot of unknown writers as soon as a man's name is known he grows rich and i will be rich and besides i live within myself i spend half the day at the bibliotheque st genevieve learning all that i want to learn i should not go far unless i knew more than i do so at this moment i am almost happy in a few days i have fallen in with my life very gladly i begin the work that i love with daylight my subsistence is secure i think a great deal and i study i do not see that i am open to attack on any point now that i have renounced a world where my vanity might suffer at any moment the great men of every age are obliged to lead lives apart what are they but birds in the forest they sing nature falls under the spell of their song and no one should see them that shall be my lot always supposing that i can carry out my ambitious plans 
madame de bargeton i do not regret a woman who could behave as she behaved does not deserve a thought nor am i sorry that i left angouleme she did wisely when she flung me into the sea of paris to sink or swim this is the place for men of letters and thinkers and poets here you cultivate glory and i know how fair the harvest is that we reap in these days nowhere else can a writer find the living works of the great dead the works of art which quicken the imagination in the galleries and museums here nowhere else will you find great reference libraries always open in which the intellect may find pasture and lastly here in paris there is a spirit which you breathe in the air it infuses the least details every literary creation bears traces of its influence you learn more by talk in a cafe or at a theatre in one half hour than you would learn in ten years in the provinces here in truth wherever you go there is always something to see something to learn some comparison to make extreme cheapness and excessive dearness there is paris for you there is honeycomb here for every bee every nature finds its own nourishment so though life is hard for me just now i repent of nothing on the contrary a fair future spreads out before me and my heart rejoices though it is saddened for the moment good-bye my dear sister do not expect letters from me regularly it is one of the peculiarities of paris that one really does not know how the time goes life is so alarmingly rapid i kiss the mother and you and david more tenderly than ever lucien End of chapter 4